This is Jocko Podcast number 448 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Also joining us tonight is Craig Jones. Craig Jones is a jiu-jitsu black belt and a submission grappling practitioner from Australia who has competed at the highest level in the sport, racked up a bunch of wins a bunch of, against a bunch of incredibly talented people, and he's done all that while maintaining a solid sense of humor and managed to become one of the most recognizable names in jiu-jitsu with one of the most recognizable schools in jiu-jitsu, the B team out of Austin, Texas. And recently he launched what will be the highest paying by a lot grappling competition of all time, the Craig Jones Invitational, CJI, which will take place in August in Vegas, with competitors being paid ten thousand and one dollars to compete, and the bracket winners being paid one million dollars, which is a lot of money. And the prize money that has been being offered has brought in the best jujitsu and grappling competitors in the world, and it's created quite a stir. And we'll get into that. Craig, thanks for joining us, man. Good to be here. Good yeah. to be here. Thanks for swinging by the open mat this morning. No worries. This is my first Navy SEAL podcast. Yeah, I know. And I know you're fond of that. And it is the first <laughs> Navy SEAL podcast. Uh, I don't know about that. But yeah, the the uh, Navy SEAL podcast, listening to Navy SEAL podcasts, taking ice baths and other recommended protocols for <laughs> apex predatoring is, I know you're highly fond of those things. <laughs> yeah, recovery is big on my uh, to-do list. Uh, yeah, you'll do it later, I guess, at some point? Probably, need to see a doctor after Tijuana for sure. <laughs> right on, man, uh, thanks for coming by. So a little bit, some people, there's a few people left that listen to podcasts that don't train jujitsu. You You grew up in Australia, born in 1991. Yep, Where in yep. Australia you grew up? Adelaide. 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 Correct pronunciation there as well. Right so, on. Echo Charles, yes. approved. Yep. <laughs> approved. <laughs> what'd, your, what'd your parents do? Uh, my dad was an electrician, my mom secretary. Cool. And at what point did you get into jiu-jitsu? Like how old were you? I would say about 15 years mm-hmm. old. Started what were you into before that? Australian rules football, a little bit of basketball, surf life saving. Not good at any of those mm-hmm. things, unfortunately. How'd you find jiu-jitsu? What year was it? What year was it? That's a great question. But man, my memory's bad uh-huh. on a week to week basis. But it probably would have been like two thousand six <laughs> okay. around then. What? How'd you find it? My older cousin, who was a four stripe white belt, was teaching it. So I'd go to his class. It'd be oh, like okay. two people there. Yeah. I don't. We really didn't have any black belts in the city. Nothing. So we were just winging it. I was just watching UFC matches, trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah. My first teacher was like a high level white belt as well, but it was nineteen ninety two. So. That was a lot back then. Like if you were a high level white belt, you could pretty much kick anyone's ass. Like it was pretty impressive. So I'm sure your cousin was doing pretty well down there. Eventually, yeah. But I mean, like, I never even got exposed to a black belt until purple belt. Okay. Like he would get promoted. I'd have to wait for him to get the next belt for me to get the next belt. But we never, <laughs> we just, I never even rolled with a black belt for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> when did you eventually get like uh, to a school where you had a black belt teaching you? Um, I moved to Melbourne in 2015 to train with Lachlan Giles. Okay. So he offered me offered me the coveted 6.30 a.m. morning class. Nice. Oh, yeah. So I was able to move to Melbourne and train with him. And then basically was there for two, two and a half years. I'd been purple belt for years. So mm-hmm. I pretty soon got the brown and then one year later black belt. When you moved there, your sole goal was to just train jujitsu. Avoid real work, basically yeah. prolong an existence <laughs> without a nine to five. <laughs> how many hours a day did you train at your peak of like hours a day training? How was your peak? Well, I would teach and train in the morning class six to what was it six thirty seven thirty. Mm-hmm. I would train in our pro class, which would be ten thirty, and then I would go lift some weights, maybe do some private lessons, and then I would teach a night class as well and do some rolling and that. So I'd be like, there'd be a lot of training throughout mm-hmm. the day, far too much. Far too much to manage. It's very bad on the body, I think. Like three hours a day, you think of rolling jujitsu? I would say so. But uh-huh. obviously some of those were the beginner classes, yeah. just easy yeah. stuff, but some of those rounds were tough. What's the most hours you ever put in, Echo Charles? In it one day? Yeah, but consistently. Yeah, well, yeah, like the regular, like weights and conditioning mm-hmm. in the day and mm-hmm. then training at night. Yeah. 
but yeah, no, nothing like that. But what about when BJ Penn is training like <clears throat> six hours a day, seven hours a day? You know what I mean? What about those days? No, I have none of those days, no. Did you ever do that, Craig? Never. Never would either. <laughs> <laughs> I might lie about it. <laughs> I, well, I always would tell MMA fighters that you can train jiu-jitsu like a lot. And if you roll kind of chill, you can roll more. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Fully. And you can still get a lot out of it? Pulling guard, yeah, you can do, you can do a lot of that, you know? But if you have to wrestle, then... <laughs> yeah, ra- no, wrestling's different. Wrestling's different, for sure. Um, but that's what you did. You moved out to Melbourne so you could get good at jiu-jitsu and avoid having some sort of actual job. Avoid responsibilities. That's largely the goal I had then, and that's what's driven me to this point now, <laughs> where I'm basically a male feminist fighting for equality against the greatest women's grappling champion of all time, Gabby Garcia. Yeah. yeah. This is the this is the match that you have coming up. This is the match coming up. Probably the biggest challenge in my entire career. Ten time world champion. She can't even count to ten, but she's a ten time world champion. <laughs> she weighs two hundred and fifty pounds minimum. Me, hundred and eighty five pounds soaking wet. I'm five eleven, she's six <laughs> four. And that's gonna be the match take one of the matches taking place. Is that the only super fight? We have that one and we have Mackenzie Dern versus Fionn Davies. Ooh. So the two Those biggest are... women's matches in history. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, when did you start? So when did you start competing hardcore? When did you come to the States to compete? Oh, good question. I mean, I came way back in like 2013, 14. That's when I visited Victory. Mm-hmm. But I would come as like a tourist and then do some tournaments, celebrate, party afterwards, you know. But in terms of serious competition, I mean, I would do worlds and stuff. But it's like a tournament anyone can enter, you know. Mm-hmm. I guess EBI, when I first did EBI, which would have been... 2017 was the first serious US sort of event I did. That, then did you go from there to ADCC? Yeah, I did the, what did I do? I did the EBI middleweights, then I did ADCC, and then I did the EBI absolute. Mm. That was the year I probably had the biggest uh, sort of breakout. When you did the ADCC, is that the, 2017 you submitted like Leandro Lowe, and Leandro that- Murillo. I did 2015, but um, I did the one in Brazil, lost immediately first round to Homolo Bajal. <laughs> but I just was in it for the free vacation of Brazil. 2017 took it a little more serious. Uh, you lost to Keenan, right? I lost to Keenan. In Jorge? Yes, yeah. He did a little slippery thing on the restart, but I forgive him for it. And I also lost to Gordon. What did you learn from the slippery thing on the restart? Um, what did he do? Well, in uh, your opinion, in, he's not here uh, to defend himself. Uh, I feel free attack. to attack him because he was attacking the CJI because it coincides with his Hall of Fame speech. So we'll circle back and attack him for this restart. <laughs> but I like uh, I went for a leg entry, I think. And then as he escaped, he sort of fleed the mat and I got a body lock and we put him into a turtle position. And then the referee started us back up. Then he wouldn't let me lock my hands. And then he kind of turned around before the ref said go. So I should have been more of an asshole and insisted on my grips, mm. but that's not my style. Mm-hmm. Then I shot a flying triangle and lost points for it. Yeah. But we risked it all for it. <laughs> for glory. For the highlight reel. <laughs> yeah. Were you still living in, in, on that run, were you still living in Australia? Yes, yeah, I was still in Melbourne. I'd been in Melbourne for about a year at that point. When you, when you would come to the States, did you feel like the level was gonna be better for your training here? At that, I mean, after that point, I mostly just try to make as much money as possible doing seminars. Mm -hmm. And then I realized just doing seminars not good for my competition record. So then Mm -hmm. I needed somewhat of a home base. So I went to New York, just everyone was Nogi focused at Henzo Grace's, just seemed like the best spot. Mm -hmm. Had John, had the full DDS crew there. Mm -hmm. What was the welcome aboard there like? What was the welcome? I mean, it was pretty friendly. What was funny was I competed against Gordon at the EBI event. And we both were doing Kasai the next week, and that was when I popped his arm. Mm. And then he ended up choking me with the same arm, the bastard. But the <laughs> next week, we arrived at Kasai, and I was just winging it. Like, I would just put on Instagram, well, I need a coach for this event. <laughs> so that's how I had Denny Prokopos in my corner for the EBI. Again, he's saying words that I didn't even know what they mean. You know, but I was hoping it was distracting my opponent. But then at Kasai, there was like four locker rooms, and they just threw me in the locker room with Danaher's entire team. So I was like, oh, this is strange. We just had the match last week, and now I'm in the Lions down with them. But it was pretty friendly, and then I just went and trained with them the next week. Where did you live when you went to New York? Where did I live? I lived in Harlem, Brooklyn, and then ultimately I moved to Hoboken. Did you get a green card? Like, how did you get over here? How did you stay there? Was it just all illegal alien activity? 
I still don't. I'm still not legal alien. <laughs> Every time I enter, I come to the Mexican border. Waltz right across. They look at me. They think I'm hiking. <laughs> How long did you uh, do you spend? You stayed there. What was that? 2019 that you moved to there to uh, Donaher. Yeah. So I did probably two and a half years in Melbourne. Two and a half years with uh, Donaher's crew before I just destroyed the gym from within like a spy, <laughs> and then B team from then on out. There on out. <laughs> When you were training with uh, Donaher, did you up your hours of training when you were there or no? We, uh, good question, actually. It was kind of, um, when we were in New York, it was much more organized because mm-hmm. he had to rely on Henzo Gracie's schedule to a certain extent. Class on the schedule said it started at 12, it started at 12.45. Mm-hmm. He would be on time 45 minutes late every session. Mm-hmm. So I think we'd do two a days, three days a week, one a day, three days a week. Mm-hmm. And if you were lucky, you'd give you Sunday off. I'd always take a rest day. Mm-hmm. I'd insist on that rest day. And then when we went down to Puerto Rico, the schedule was open. Like he could use the gym any time he wanted. So sometimes those classes would be like over three hours, mm-hmm. just way too much, just for me, <laughs> killing me. Did you start breaking down physically or just get bored? In New York, I would get staff every month, mm. every month. I think that's like a bit of overtraining as well. Mm-hmm. I think everyone's got a different sort of yeah. workload they're capable of. Mm-hmm. For me, mine's at the very bottom. <laughs> Minimum. <laughs> That's where I'm optimized. <laughs> so then you guys all took off and went down to Puerto Rico? Yeah, we went it, down. And when you were in Puerto Rico, you are saying that some of the classes would be three hours long, and it was in the middle of COVID, and you just had nothing to do but jujitsu. Yeah. We, I, I loved Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans hated me. That mm-hmm. was a real big hurdle for us down there. You know, like, uh, just, <laughs> I, th- I think they think I'm down there dodging taxes super rich. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, <laughs> not. That was not the case. But that's the, <laughs> that's the vibe I felt like uh, we, give, we gave down there. Then who left, who left Puerto Rico first? I mean, like, yeah, this is, this is where the story gets weird. You yeah. know what I mean? Because it's like, we were in Puerto Rico. We all universally kind of kind of wanted to leave because it's, it's just hard to have responsibilities down there. It'd be awesome if you lived in that bubble, they call it, which is like the Dorado Beach Ritz-Carlton hotel combination and you had like an assistant that would go do everything for you. But like you have to live in a regular apartment down there and do run your own errands. You don't know how long that's going to take, yeah. you know? Like they'll send you on a wild goose chase. I remember I didn't have keys to my mailbox and you'd think oh wow that must be an easy thing to get not easy at all i asked the apartment building they're like we don't know i asked the owner he's like we i don't know i asked the landlord i don't know everyone just keeps sending in a different direction turned out what i had to do which should have been obvious was buy a new lock for the mailbox and wait until the mailman arrived and then we changed the lock together you know so it's like that sort of level of chaos was too much for me i had to get out of there and, and did you know you were going to Texas? Yeah, we wanted to go to Texas because Flow Grappling was there, and it was also central. Like if we compete, if we were in New York, we'd have to travel to California to compete. It'd be a bit mm-hmm. of annoying. During COVID, there were tons of grappling events with Flow Grappling in Austin, Texas. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, nowadays they're putting them in these random Texas cities because I think they were getting really good discounted deals on the. Uh, whatever venues they hired during COVID because no one else wanted them. Mm-hmm. Now we're in Austin, but most of the shows are in other parts of Texas. When you, so there's this big split up with uh, Don Her Death Squad and you guys, and you end up with uh, your crew. And did they, did you guys all know that you were all gonna end up in Texas or was that just a weird, awkward thing that just happened? Well, honestly, Danaher and Gordon were the ones making good enough money to probably justify living in Puerto Rico mm-hmm. and dodge those taxes, you know what I mean? So when the team split up, we just didn't know for sure whether they would just stay there because they really did want to open a gym there. So when then we decided we'd move to Texas because we had a gym available to us, basically mm-hmm. turnkey operation. And then they- Whose gym was that? Uh, my business partner, Seth Bilal. He's running the CJI with got me. Got it, got it. But, Basically, then they followed suit, so we all ended up in Texas anyway. Very oh, Austin, Austin, Texas, super mm-hmm. strange. Mm-hmm. They're north side, we're south side, so we don't cross paths too much. Yeah. Um, in that time, are you feeling like your jiu-jitsu is getting better? Um, you're still improving, you're still training all the time. You end up with uh, with freaking Nicky Rod and, and Nicky Ryan. 
I mean, you, you put together the B team's freaking badass. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like uh, we didn't know who was going to go with who initially. It mm-hmm. ended up basically being the original TDS crew minus Eddie Cummings, wherever he is. So mm-hmm. Gordon, <laughs> Gary, John all stayed uh, together. They kept Taza. Some of the guys that stayed were like, oh, you can keep them. Some people were sad they didn't come with us, but you know how it is when the team splits up. Yeah, so we had Nicky Rod, Ethan, Nicky Ryan, Damian Anderson. He hesitated. He stayed with them for a little bit and then came mm-hmm. over later. But yeah, everyone's both of us got pretty big teams now. John just rebuilt, hired in some new guns, mm-hmm. brought in Marigali, the Brazilian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're kicking ass too. Cool. And so this, so now you're you're doing all kinds of competition at this point. You got freaking. Um, oh yeah. You said, well, do I feel like I'm improving? I mean, my goal is always just to sell instructionals. So like, I'm motivated by creativity to see a void in the instructional market because that's the biggest cash cow. So in terms of improvement, <laughs> I measure in can I hit moves that'll sell in instructionals <laughs> rather than the overall art of the sport. <laughs> you're not about the art. You're about the money. About the money, for sure. <laughs> the little money. Uh, yeah, I'm in the wrong spot for money. When you were doing, like, what were you doing for money in New York? What were you doing for money in Puerto Rico? Just Only seminars? Fans. Oh, that's right. You were. I was selling you know underwear. what's awkward enough is I didn't know what OnlyFans were. You're the first person that I knew <laughs> that I heard of OnlyFans on. <laughs> I know that's a, I'm a, look, I'm a 50 year old married man, dude. Like, that's I the story you. I stick to, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I see you with like this OnlyFans thing, and I didn't really know what it was. And then I very quickly figured it out. I go, Charles. Yeah, yes, <laughs> well, that's actually the, the secret funder of the tournament is that me and Gabby's collaboration will make the $3 million <laughs> investment back. <laughs> betting on myself for that. <laughs> so, you st- but you were kind of early into OnlyFans, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I shouldn't say this now because they could still sue me, but I thought it'd be funny to sell rash cars that said to subscribe to me on OnlyFans. And then they were really successful. And I was like, shit, they might sue me. And I'm like, what if I start an OnlyFans and I'm just marketing my own position on their platform? Yeah. But isn't that what OnlyFans is for? Yeah. But I was selling clothing with the logo on it. Oh. Mm-hmm. But then I thought, hey, if we're on the platform, is it still copyright infringement? You know? Did they ever come at you? Not yet. Not but maybe yet. after Probably this. they will now. <laughs> <laughs> it w- but you were doing instructionals on OnlyFans? Yeah, I would do anything, honestly. A lot of the time, <laughs> if people pay me the money, I'd do anything. A lot of the time, they'd pay me to send direct insulting messages to their training partners. Uh, so I'd be like, hey, can you send this Instagram hand away direct message? And I'd just send them a video message assaulting them, telling them everyone in the gym hates them. How much um, would you make for an insulting video? It started at $50 a video, but I had to put up to 100 because I guess that many people hate their training partners. Yeah. That'd be most of it. And you would you come up with your own original material for these insults? or They'd would give you... me a little, oh, a couple hints. Guidance. So it'd be a, per, a real, real personal attack on them. <laughs> <laughs> I get that too. Some people will get me to, you know, hey, can you, hey, my buddy, you know, Fred's not here. He was supposed to come out, but he chickened out at the last minute. Can you tell him, you know, can you talk some shit to him? And they'd get all fired up for me to tell their buddy fred yeah. that you know hey we're down here training where are you at you're weak <laughs> boom yeah, yeah, and they're all fired up i don't charge money for it but i guess i'm not that smart yeah, doing it for the love of the game it. yeah just for the, <laughs> love of the game for the love of talking it is a weird thing though right talk smack to my friends i don't know but it works uh like so is that where you got that's where you made your money from that and the instructors mostly the instructionals. oh that's right that so bjjfanatics.com you yeah, got, those guys. Actually, I counted your instructionals the other day. You have 26 videos here on, on BJJ. I'm running out of ideas now. BJJfanatics.com. That's all, that's all the moves I've got. <laughs> <laughs> BJJfanatics.com. Uh, they have... It's so awesome that you could... Imagine if you had had that back in the day when you were on Adelaide, Australia, and you're learning from a four-stripe white belt. Yeah, it would have been sick because I couldn't have afforded them, but I would have illegally downloaded them. Yeah, you would have figured something out. <laughs> it's unbelievable that you can do that now that that exists we used to have to because i'm older than you and we <laughs> i had the books too i used to read the books yeah we had the books <laughs> but we had the gracie in action videos and we had the ufc like there's like six videos of ufc so we'd watch those but you really couldn't tell too much of what was going on in those early ufcs you weren't getting a ton out of it but nowadays with bjj fanatics and all the other online instructionals, OnlyFans with only Craig fans Jones. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you do do you do instructionals on there though? Are you I, like, hey, here's an arm lock escape or whatever? I haven't 
I'm going to start doing it again. We're talking, we're trying to talk them into sponsoring our event because like it'd be a good, good to have them yeah. participate in the Gabby Garcia match in some regard, you know, yeah. especially as a collab afterwards. But I might end up back on the platform. <laughs> I'm trying to decide between that and Patreon for some yeah. sort of behind the scenes. I'll still put the full instructionals out, yeah. but behind the scenes stuff on the travels that maybe keep it behind a paywall somewhere. Yeah, that'll work. So, you're doing, you're, but you're still competing. Do you do you enjoy competing? Not really. <laughs> no. I don't really like it at all. It's hard. Well, I'd rather get paid to do other things. Yeah, you know? yeah. a lot of pressure. On and you've racked things. up some serious second place wins over the years. Every tournament there is, <laughs> I've got a silver medal. <laughs> you've uh, what? You, you've won, you've been the champion of like Polaris. You've been you've won some championships. Yeah, some but you've also have won some significant second yeah. place I've matches. Got more famous for the losses, you know. Those are really it, and that's obviously last ADCC. I was in the final against Kaina and Twatch. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that one. I'm trying to think what happened in it. They gave him 24 negative points, and I still couldn't win. So that's when I was like, "This organization must be corrupt. I need to start." You got 24 it. negative points. I think it was 12 or so. Uh -huh. They really tried to give me the win, and that's something I, I won't stand for. I'm failing. <laughs> Um, submission underground with Kael Sonnen you've done or Chael Sonnen you've done I that I won so many matches on there and then he goes you know what you can face Mason Fowler and we'll give the winner a belt bang lost immediately <laughs> there's something on the line I lose <laughs> how about combat jiu-jitsu you did that against Donald, Donald Cerrone I did that yeah I did that against Cowboy we did um, we went down in Mexico for that and uh you're a lot bigger than he is aren't you yeah that's why i picked the match <laughs> <laughs> gotta be strategic uh, <laughs> did you just watch glover watch glover against uh jeff glover oh against did, uriah yeah against I uriah. It. how did that go um isn't glover banged up though yeah i mean glover's banged up you could see that one of those two individuals has been training mma for a long time <laughs> and like wrestled and you know I love Glover, like he's a friend and he's a freaking, his jiu is phenomenal. But, you know, you gotta train for a match like that. Literally train for a match like that. It's a different thing. And I, I heard Glover afterwards, he's, he said he was so freaking exhausted. Oh, shit. You know, five minutes into it. He, he put a Darce on him, like he had some stuff on him. And look, Uriah is obviously, dude, he's a freaking a champion in his own right. But it was a bummer to watch and you need to train for that i mean basically jeff went in with pure jujitsu and you know jeff's well, what's jeff 40 i think jeff is 40. something like i don't that. know how you rise per not yeah i think he's rise older yeah he might even be older huh i think it feels like it i don't they're know. well they're a similar age but you know uriah was a ufc athlete for his basically his whole adult life and, and a, probably and a healthier lifestyle too i'm just gonna hazard a guess there it's possible. I, I would say yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No ice pass for Jeff Glover, I don't think. <laughs> no, Jeff. Jeff's lived a full life, you know? I respect it. Jeff's jujitsu is sick. S sick. It's so Deep sick. Deep off guard, sick. Uh, I miss Bill Cooper, too. Bill Cooper and him back in the day. Oh, the yeah. Way. Those guys were freaking awesome. And actually, Bill's still like competing right now. And obviously, Jeff is, too. Jeff is crazy, unorthodox, flexible, like weird. Like it's weird. Yeah, he needs to. I don't know how he translates that to instructional sales. That might be targeted at the the, the girlfriend market of a jiu jitsu athlete. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, how about coaching on the Ultimate Fighter? You did that too. How, yeah. how was that? How'd you like that? That was fun, but I don't really enjoy MMA coaching because it's so, like, I don't know, MMA is so violent. You know, mm -hmm. it's like your friends, like when you become attached to those. I mean, there's no consequences in jiu jitsu. What's the yeah. worst that could happen? Yeah. But when it's your friends and stuff out there, I don't know, it's hard we see get knocked out or something yeah. bad happen. So like in terms of the MMA coaching, it feels much, much more serious. And it's also much, many more consequences there. Mm -hmm. So it's like I I steer clear to coaching a lot of MMA guys just because mm -hmm. of that. Do you, but you enjoy coaching Volk? For sure, for sure. Well, and he's obviously a personal friend as well. So it's like, I love that aspect of it, but also it's, it is horrible mm -hmm. when your guy loses. Way, way worse than taking a jiu-jitsu L. Yeah, dude, getting hit in the head and knocked out is rough for your life. And it's different for different people, by the way, too, because some people get knocked out a bunch of times and they grow up and they get old and they're fine. Some people, it really does a lot of damage to them. Uh, how about being on the TV show and everything? 
What was that like? I mean, they learnt quickly to keep me off the air as much as possible. Oh, yeah. They definitely didn't appreciate some of the humour, so <laughs> I was yeah. in the background there, but I they tried. They edited a lot of Greg Jones content from, yeah. that, from that event. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yeah, they got angry because I was fucking with the COVID test as well at the time. Like, we pretended to put Ortega's test up our ass, but <laughs> <laughs> they did not like that. They wanted to fire me for that. <laughs> but what do you do with a COVID test? That was the back of the throat one, so it was oh, uh, real so intimate you, exposure. Intimate. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't like that too much? Did it make the show or no? No, they cut it out and they told me not to post it on social, so they'd kick me off the show. Yeah. The man. Should I, I should ask for forgiveness, not permission. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were a little slow on that one. Um, so back to ADCC 2022, you, you, you lose in the fourth round. Um, and did that leave a bad taste in your mouth, like worse than normal because that finals or what? Like, No, I'm pretty accepting of defeat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm t- totally okay with it. Uh, I ended up doing the 99 that year because I had two teammates in the 88 uh-huh. and if I had done the 88 kilos, it would have been uh, those two guys would have had to face off first round. Yeah. And I also looked at 99 and said, that might be easier. So yeah. I tried to stack on the weight for it and kind of just, uh, I had Marigali. How much did you weigh going into it? Ooh, I think 215. Mm-hmm. And some of those What's guys- What's your walk around weight? I don't even know right now. <laughs> I barely even check the scales now. <laughs> Probably 205, 210, fluctuate uh-huh. right around there. Uh-huh. The 215 back then was a bit of a more juiced up, Ready uh-huh. for ADCC 215. It was a Gabby Garcia esque posture. How 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 long before a competition do you go on uh, steroids? I would just stay on always. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Like what? Well, you know what I mean? Like, do it's you ever like, see uh, a doctor or whatever, or do you just kind of play it by ear? They reach out to me from time to time uh-huh. about the blood pressure. No. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm actually in between testosterone replacement therapy sponsorships, so I was on. Evertite in Texas, mm-hmm. and now we can't announce it yet, but I've moved to a national brand mm-hmm. of TRT. So How much just, better do you feel when you do it? Oh, incredible, yeah. How old are you? 33. You feel incredibly better? Yeah, much better, much better. Because I, f- I feel like uh, if your diet's poor, your sleep's poor, <laughs> your lifestyle's poor, if you're on TRT, those test levels never change. You know what I mean? Bad diet, test levels stay the same. And that's the stability we want in life. <laughs> yeah. Cutting corners. <laughs> so, you're, you're, can you, is it just like, uh, I, had, I had a friend that was in, um, was like a, a cyclist. And he said when, when, when someone's a cyclist and they're on it, it's like a different, it's like a different kind of human being. Do you feel like, that much better when you're on it for me i do so many things that bring me below baseline i feel like it just equals me <laughs> so out you're of it, feeling you like know? you break it's a break yeah it's break. like it just gives me back to you know what i mean that middle ground middle of the row i feel i mean some guys will say they inject they feel it that day i feel nothing i can sometimes i'm lazy i forget to inject it you know <laughs> i feel no different <laughs> was this anybody but were the people in Texas were guiding you down yeah, this? Oh, yeah, we had a protocol mm-hmm. for sure. My basic protocol was um, tests, uh, Scipion A, a little bit of Deca, not too much because you get the infamous Deca dick, and then Anavar as well. I throw in some Anavar from get spicy from time to time. <laughs> it's like... Uh, uh, just the basic, the, the basic stuff. Bit of Cialis for the blood pressure is good too. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not taking enough. Blood pressure is sky high. What do they say about like your long-term health? Well, the, here's the thing, right? When we transferred to the new TRT, they were like, listen, we need to give you a battery of tests. Make sure you're not going to die on us during the uh, sponsorship. Oh, that yeah, would, yeah, yeah, that would, yeah, would yeah, not be good, good. for a wellness uh, center. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the Ronnie Coleman on... That's, that was my reference was Ronnie Coleman on Joe Rogan where Joe was like asking him what kind of steroids he took back there. He's like, oh no, just just the basic yeah. stuff. Yeah. Just DECA, test, Winstrol. Like he just kind of went down the list. Just the basics. I was like, dang, dude. <laughs> the craziest one's Halo testing. What is this now? What's it? That's the strongest oral steroid out there. What's, What's it, it called? called? Halos, Halo testing. Halo and what is it? Have you tried it? I've tried it, yeah. What does it do? Um, it'll actually make your dick bigger, but also if you take it too long, you get liver failure pretty quick, so you've got to be sucks. careful on it. And, that, you, and you've tried it? Yeah, it didn't work for me. When you say it didn't work for you, what do you mean? Like you didn't feel <laughs> anything? No, no, obviously it worked in that uh, sense, but yeah, I've tried it before. All about making your dick big. 
Yeah. Dick seems so. He lost size, actually, I think. No. Um, work for Gabby, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I try to, I try to, but I mean, some of those bodybuilding things are just for bodybuilding, you know, yeah, like you yeah. take that, you try to do any cardiovascular exercise, it's not going to be yeah. too conducive. Like some guys taking Tran out there, like I know a former teammate of mine would love a bit of Tran. Mm -hmm. Have you tried Tran? I've not tried Tran, no. That's the one I haven't tried. That sounds a bit too crazy. I, I, I've heard it's pretty crazy and uh, Echo Charles and I send memes to each other back and forth and reels and whatnot about Tran. I heard it makes you gay. I heard some of the guys over in Thailand. Have you heard this? No. I, heard I have it. not heard of that. No. I heard there's a correlation between trend in Thailand and uh, interest in ladyboys. Interesting. Okay. We don't right. need trend for that interest, though. You know? okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, so, at what point did you get the idea for CJI? Because this is a pretty revolutionary thing going on. The, um, you know, one of the reasons I was asking you about money and how you made money was because jujitsu, I've had this conversation with quite a few jujitsu, like top level guys in the world. I remember I had this conversation with, with Dean Lister, with Jeff Glover. I was like, Jeff, if you were this good at basketball, you'd be a, you know, you'd be worth a hundred million dollars. If you were this good at whatever football, you'd be worth a hundred million dollars. Unfortunately, you're just really good at jujitsu. <laughs> and that's why you, you're living in your van, Jeff Glover, you know, like he's, <laughs> one of the best of all time yeah, and for sure. and you know just don't make much money from it so this what you've put together is a total game changer and i heard the rutolo is talking about it you know you started about injecting a million dollars that's how much money people make in their whole lives in a normal job they make that money in 30 years in a normal job so this is a, a it's a game changer for the sport when did you come up with the idea for it Honestly, I think it was, uh, I was in Dubai for Karate Combat and I was talking to the investor. He, he, he's not in Dubai, but we were just on the phone. He's mm -hmm. like a friend of mine. And I was like, uh, so what started the beef was people kept asking me if I was doing ADCC. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you win four matches against the best in the world, you get $10,000. I'm like, that's hard to be motivated to do a training camp, put myself through more hallow testing and all these other substances. <laughs> So I just wanted a bit more conversation. And my thoughts were, if Flow Grappling can pay seven plus figures for the streaming rights, and they can sell 10, 11,000 seats, surely they could pay us some more money. So that was my first sort of, that's the frame of reference I was coming at. And then- And there, this is the conversation you're having with the investor for Karate Combat. Well, so I had this, I put this in a YouTube video because people kept, kept asking me, and then the response to that was basically Seth Daniels, who's ADCC organizer, Mo Jassim's sort of right-hand man, was like, basically, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Like T-Mobile, which is the new venue, costs $2 million for the weekend. Mm -hmm. So he throws that out there like an idiot. And we're all like, well, why would you spend $2 million on a venue for, for a jiu-jitsu competition? <laughs> and that's when sort of the back and forth started going down, obviously a lot of emotions. I'm over there for karate combat. I'm thinking of ways to just provoke them into having to pay more money. So I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll do a seminar a week of ADCC and I'll give the money, the proceeds of that to the guys that lose on the first day of ADCC because they get no money. If you lose on day one, zero dollars. You walk away with zero dollars. So I told my uh, friend this and he's like, how much prize money? He's like, let's just fucking put our own tournament on the same day. That'd be funny. And that's basically where it started. That's that's its origins. And you end up getting a big investment. Big investment, yeah. Of what, $3 million? $3 million. Is and this person like a, are they known? Or are they like a- Not a, not a famous person. Investor? Just an anonymous, giving it to us, giving me too much power with this money, I think, and the jiu-jitsu world. I know, this is almost like a weird movie where you just give some random crazy guy $3 million and let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> The best is Seth Daniels literally was like, if you don't like ADCC, get your own $2 million and run your own event. And I was like, well, yeah, fuck cool. it, now Watch we're this. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the start of the whole thing. And well, I mean, we all still love ADCC. Like the history is so, mm -hmm. uh, so cool. It's like the, the history of Nogi grappling really, except it's just that the, in my opinion, the latest promoter is just wasting money on things that weren't important while saying he couldn't afford to pay the athletes more money. The women's, uh, there were two women's divisions. They would get 6K, men would get 10K. To win? Those were the women. To winning. win, to win, yeah. And the yeah. women's divisions were only eight people instead of 16. 
So then they kept saying, I didn't know what I was talking about. And then as soon as we started, their competitors started jumping ship, seeing the million instead of the $10,000 and a medal, mm. they had to change something. So the first thing they did was they raised the women's pay to that to being equal of men's. And he did it easily after saying that he couldn't do it. Mm. And then they started paying secret, different amounts of show money. So the prize money is 10K. Then show money started going out, which is something they've never done before. Mm. And that's completely the, I guess, the promoter, Moe's, it's within his realm of responsibility to do that. Mm -hmm. But then the problem with that is if you start giving now different people different amounts of show money, someone like me is gonna hear about that and tell all the other competitors to now ask for more money. So when you say show money, that's the money to show, to, to show, show up, to show. right? And like, that's, that's what we do with ours. They get 10K to win, right. you get $10,001 to participate in our event. Hell yeah, because it's, it's more. Just a little bit more, yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. But he's, as far as I know, allegedly, some of those guys are getting six figures show money, which is so crazy because the prize money is 10. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you get maybe 100K to show, 10K to win. Yeah. It's it. You just raise the prize money. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, it's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, and then you earn it, right? Because, look, I don't want anyone to get hurt, but if I'm already getting 100K to show up and you catch me in a freaking heel hook, I'm just going to be like tapping like, okay, I'll get you next year or whatever. Yeah, damn. Less but, than 10K. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if there's 100 grand on the line, then I'm probably going to go a little bit harder and maybe lose my ACL or whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I can get surgery on that, right? Um, rules. Let's talk about let's talk about these rules that you got going on in this. It's who came up with the rule set? I felt like to think I did mostly. Yeah. What? Okay. So first thing, it's three five minute rounds. Three correct? fives. Yeah. Because we just didn't want to like sometimes you watch a match where a guy takes a guy's back, he holds it for ten minutes or mm -hmm. so. You know, like we want the action to be pushed the entire time. How do you avoid ten or five minutes or or let's say four minutes of patty cake, stand up, fake shots? crappy wrestling, you know, a takedown for one minute holding on the ground. Now he gets stood up again for five more minutes, three more minutes, five more minutes of patty cake. How do you avoid that? Well, I think basically the patty cake problem is the mat space. Mm. There's no push out rule in a regular jujitsu event. So you can just go out of bounds. Like we can't do a cage because the cage being vertical and guys are so good defensively on the fence. Then we just have fence wrestling for mm. Like MMA guys obviously use strikes yeah. amongst the fence wrestling. To open up the wrestling. Yeah. To open up the wrestling. So then we basically uh, saw the angled walls karate combat use. And that what that does, it means if you back up, it's to your disadvantage. Because if they shoot a takedown and you're anywhere near, you're not going to be able to sprawl. Your back's going to hit it. They're going to be able to take you down. So theoretically... How uh, tall are the walls? That's a great question. I should know because I've competed in are that Are they before. like waist high though? No, no, no. They'll be up to like they'll be above my shoulders high. Oh, dang! Yeah, so you got you're not getting out of that pit too easy. Dang! That's They're, why actually I remember the karate combat guys telling me they had problems initially because the pit never used to open. So if a guy got knocked out bad enough, like how do you get him out of the pit? You have to drag him out of the wall, <laughs> you know. So they had to create a pit that would open so they could stretch the guys out. This is good. My I used to think it would be cool to have jujitsu matches in a big salad bowl. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, you got to have something that's yeah. negative about backing up. Yeah, where you can't, like, you know, a salad bowl gets steep towards yeah. the top. So you could kind of back away, but eventually you would get to where you couldn't back away yeah. anymore. Yeah. So you kind of created a salad bowl scenario. Do you guys love to toss some salad for sure? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you got that going for you. Uh, no ref, basically, very little referee interference. Although ADCC, there's a lot of cool highlight reels that go out of bounds. Mm -hmm. It is a safety hazard, crashing at the table. Yeah. Like, obviously, Shanji Hibera is good at those out-of-bounds rules. How, how do you, how do you uh, view the thing if you've got a shoulder-high wall around the thing? Very is expensive. Is it or something like very, that? This was a very expensive choice for us, unfortunately, is we had to basically build an pla elevated platform around it mm. so that, obviously, they're really good seating. They're going to see straight in yeah. to the pit. That must have That's been expensive. crazy expensive. Very, very expensive. Yeah, the pit, the pit's a big investment. I think it's going to cost us a lot of money to have that pit build. But it's very important because it's like, it's just showing there's a better sort of platform for people mm. to compete in. They Karate Combat calls the pit, we call ours the alley. 
interesting. <laughs> this is like I we're like fighting it. in an alley. You echo yeah. you like that. Yes, sir. You approve of that. Approve. 100%. You only do one of two things in an alley. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, number one, number one rule we got uh, three five minute rounds. And to prevent patty cake, we've got, and by the way, by patty cake, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you go to some jujitsu competitions, if there's a couple people that are either good at wrestling and they don't, not good at jujitsu, they don't want to go to the ground, so they'll just like play patty cake for five minutes, which is really boring to watch. Um, so, in order to get rid of that, you've got these, the alley, three, three five minute rounds, 10 point must system. So, this is like MMA in the fact that at the end of each round, someone's gonna get 10 points if they dominated the round, and someone's gonna get less than 10 points, either nine or whatever. Um, and they have to, that, that's the way it has to be. Can they have a draw? Can it be nine nine in one of those rounds? If, I mean, it's a 10 point mass, so it has to be. Someone has to get 10 unless they get a negative. Mm. But we will do negatives if people are obviously stalling or just being overly evasive. But mm -hmm. we're, what we're really hoping is that guys can strategize because they know the pit. To back someone into the pit or to the angled wall, mm -hmm. we should call it the alley for legal purposes. Yes, we'll call it the alley. Um, is to their detriment. So we're hoping we're able that a lot of the stalling penalties won't need to come into effect because by someone backing up, there's incentive to chase them. Because if they back up into that angled wall, they'll be at a disadvantage. Whereas if someone backs up into open space of an out of bounds, mm -hmm. the ref will be like, stop, stop, reset. Is there only one match at a time? One match at a time, yeah. How big is the alley? 30 by 40. Big, big alley. Yeah, that's a big size. Oh, yeah, that's a big size. Big alley for a big woman. We needed a right enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of each round, there's going to be judging. Um, who, who, how are you picking the judges? How are we picking them? Yeah. Who are um, whoever's going to be most biased towards my team for the million <laughs> and the 10% I'm going to take off those guys. Now we've got Jason Herzog involved as okay, the head, right yeah. head ref. Um, and then the judging team, we've secured like three of the five now because obviously it's going to be a long day. That first mm -hmm. day is going to be long. ADCC do th first day three mounts. So they can yeah. chew through a lot of matches at once. Us, one, one mat space, yeah. two divisions. Yeah. It's a long day. That's a long Hopefully way. Hopefully there's some quick finishes. But again, like you said, like with the amount of money on the line, I think it's going to be yeah. some serious injuries. When the Gracies used to do, I think it was, it was actually Hickson that used to run this tournament. It was no time limit. And you could win by 15 points or submission. And I mean, this was back in the day, but most of those matches were short, like shorter than, you know, like some half hour drawn out thing. So you never know. This might go quicker than people expect because they want to get it done. Some of the judging, I know you got uh, uh, some rules here. The, here's the number one thing is initiating action, which people are getting judged. So the person that's being aggressive and getting after it is going to have the nod in the judges' minds. The second thing is uh, close submissions. So getting close to a submission, you get something – I've heard this described before as like, if I have to defend it, then it's close. Yeah. Is that I'm, kind of the... I mean, basically, that's the way we see it. As, yeah, if there's a real threat. See, obviously, you want judges that train to mm -hmm. know what's a real threat, what's not a real threat. I think, um, obviously, the judges will have three different angles to see it. Hopefully, two of the judges can get a clear line of sight. Oh, because they're on different sides of the yeah. alley? Of the alley, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. hopefully, two of the three will be able to see whether that's an authentic submission attempt or whether it's something to look. You know what I mean? Some, yeah. some guys will just, we don't want guys just diving on shitty footlocks and stuff. We want those to be real threats. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So if you shoot a, a single and get put in a guillotine and the guy doesn't react at all, it's kind of like, it's not a really mm -hmm. serious threat. But if he panics out of the guillotine, obviously that's going to change some yeah. things. If he has to flop on his back to avoid getting guillotine, then that's it's, Yeah, what exactly. We're we want to see like, uh, we want to, we basically kind of know who wins at exchange. Even even when you have scrambles in the gym, yeah. you kind of like, you might have initiated, but you go, oh, that guy definitely yeah. followed up with a better sort of attack out of so that you got to have some good judges that know what's up. For sure, yeah. We want guys that train, guys for the sport. Um, 
not only number two was close submissions, it's also dynamic action. So if you get a sweep, if you get a takedown, if you get a pass, all those things are sort of, there's no like necessarily points, but to the in the judge's mind, those are adding to the that person's score towards 10, I guess. For sure, yeah. Um, in a sense of like, uh, we, will, we do want the positional control as well, again. But we're, uh, guys will game any rule set. You know, they'll like, obviously EBI overtime, people just decided to stall into overtime, save their energy to overtime. Mm -hmm. So really, we want to keep the rules not super explicit so that they can, so, you know what I mean? They yeah. can take mm -hmm. advantage a good of idea. the rule set. Yeah. You know, you always have, so we, we have these rules meetings, even at Fight Pass, we had the last one, there was, man, the rules meeting went for two hours because guys were trying to ask the same question about how they, could they stall <laughs> and get away with it and they'd ask in a different way every time. You know, we want <laughs> these to be authentic. We want these guys to be trying to kill each other yeah. the entire time. We, <laughs> well, we'll get to the million dollars because that's going to make some, some people try and kill each other. And then the number three is uh, positional and dominant control. So if you get a cross what if i get cross-eyed and i just hold the person there just hold i mean I'll, in my opinion if you took the guy down or swept him pass to side control and the guy puts up no offense mm -hmm. i'd give that a 10-8 mm. give oh, that a 10-8 okay. for sure yeah you know there's there is something to be said about jujitsu and the fact that like when you if you get your guard passed and someone's across side on you and you're laying there and you can't get out that's really, if you're in a fight, bro, that's yeah. a real problem. You're losing. Yeah, you're losing bad. Yeah. In jiu-jitsu, it's no big deal. But in a real fight, you're losing bad. And you're not putting forth any, you know, advance. So I think that makes sense. So that'd be a full-on 10-8, huh? Yeah, I think ba if the guy puts up no offense at all, mm -hmm. to me, it's a 10-8. Like in MMA, that'd be a 10-8. But also, like, say you take me down, you get to my back, but you don't get the second hook. Say you have one hook, and but I still was in this bad position the entire time. It's like, I don't, we don't want to be held. Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't get the second hook. It's not a 10 eight. We still, that's basically as dominant as it gets positionally. You just didn't secure the second hook. What about, uh, if I'm going to pass your guard and you turtle up, turtle up. I mean, I think you've made me do something. So it's mm -hmm. an offensive movement, mm -hmm. but I think obviously we don't want them to just assume if that's all that happens, obviously you're going to win the round. Mm -hmm. Good. But it wouldn't be a 10-8. Because I always think that's, that's one of those things like getting the hooks in jiu-jitsu. Like, oh, I got your back and you just managed to keep your, my foot from getting in there and I don't get any points or whatever. Same thing when I pass your guard and what you do is turtle up and I didn't get any points for that either. Even though now I can just punch you in the back of the head until you're knocked out. But there's no punching. So I think that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that, that's interesting about the ADCC scoring too is that if you – sort of turtle turtle is quite, quite a safe position if you yeah. take someone down they scramble to a turtle hold for three seconds roll back to guard now it's no longer a takedown but yeah. i still think in my opinion you've still yeah done something pretty substantial there i'm surprised that rule hasn't been changed the turtle should not be considered like a safe thing it should be it should be considered a horrible thing i mean it's basically like you pass the guard if i get you to turtle and you're just showing me your back and all turtled up that's ridiculous Oh, either on a takedown or guard pass. Echo Charles? Yeah. Yay? Nay? Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's way different than the guard. It's it's actually the in wrestling, you get that's two points. Mm. That's uh, well, now it's three points, but that's takedown for sure. Yeah. Someone turtles. Well, Game over. You land, uh, yeah. Hmm. You're yeah. out. Yeah. Huh. All right. Slamming's allowed. Um, the judges. So I'm right in the fact, or I think I'm right, I interpreted this right, that you're gonna post the scores after each round. Yeah, because we want we want the open score. We don't want the decision at the end to come as a surprise. Because jiu-jitsu guys, they largely don't want to compete in a rule set they're unfamiliar with. But a lot of what we're doing here is we've added rounds, mm -hmm. and at least with the open score, and they'll know where they're at at the end of each round. Mm -hmm. But say, for example, the first rounds are 10-8. To me, you win the next two. If it's a qualifying round and not the final, and it's a draw, we're gonna do it like in wrestling last point wins. So. Mm -hmm. We don't want the guy that wins the 10-8 to think he can just coast to victory. Got it. Whoever wins the last round wins. Got so, it. So we want action the entire time. And the finals has an overtime round? The final will be five fives. Ooh. And, and one by overtime? some miracle, it's a draw. We'll go 
another round. Ooh. I think it'd be tough. Very yeah, tough. Yeah. Very rare MMA uh, sort of draws over five rounds. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's not going to happen, most likely. Um, you're doing this. One of the motivations for you doing this that I've seen you talk about is the fight foundation, the Fair Fight Foundation. What's that all about? Fair Fight or sorry, Fight Foundation dot. Is it dot org or dot com? That's a good question. I should know that. Right on. Show, right? <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes. Just we don't have show notes. Echo Charles. Well, I mean that, that was the old joke. Is like jujitsu doesn't make a profit, so why not make it a non profit? But <laughs> we're basically donating the profits on top of the event from that initial three million dollar investment to go back towards charities. So mm-hmm. luckily we're we're doing tap cancer out. Awesome. And Richard Byrne is a black belt from New York who used to run Kasai grappling. Okay. And we've got him on board. He's basically what for every dollar we donate to tap cancer out, he's gonna dollar for dollar match. So does he have a cap on that? No cap on that. Oh damn. So Rich is a bowler. So hopefully we can make put the pressure on check. him. Let's put the pressure on him. And then we we're letting some of the athletes pick because we want we wanted some of the athletes to have a say in where those charity dollars go. Mm-hmm. So for me personally, we try to do some film projects with the Fair Five Foundation. We've got one coming out about Bali, sort of like uh, the theme of the series. I mean, it's like well, we're trying to do what Bourdain did for food, but we're trying to do it make jujitsu a bit cooler than. Mm-hmm. And sort of it is, you know, it's a fine. It's more interesting people in the, the sport that are cool. Watching the sport, not as cool. But we'll do charity aspects each episode. So there's, um, we worked with a charity in Indonesia in Bali, Denpasa, in one of the slums called AK, Australian guy, teaches jiu-jitsu, helps out the local community. So for me, that'll be my personal choice of mm-hmm. charities. We're going to donate. I'm going to donate a portion of the ticket sales to him. You were you were just on um, Instagram doing some kind of Turkish wrestling, right? Is that right? Oh yeah, with the Luke Tur- Rockhold, <laughs> Turkish oil wrestling. Yes, that. And so this is. I heard you talking about this today when we were training. Um, that this is kind of the idea to go try different grappling, like historical grappling or uh, yeah, we'll cultural try. grappling around the world. We'll try anything. The Turkish one is the longest concurrently ran sporting event in the world. So I think they've been doing it for over five hundred years, and Damn. that's get some leather pants lather themselves up with oil some of those matches go 30 40 minutes some of those dudes are huge they're over mm-hmm. 300 pounds did you train like, against any of them we trained against one local guy he sort of took us to the main show we had a connection with basically considered the goats of turkish oil wrestling and he sort of hooked it all up for us when we were over there but we trained in the park with one of the local guys we put the leather pants on and stuff it was fun luke came ready he had leather pants ready to go <laughs> but obviously we used their traditional leather pants in the end mm-hmm. But that's an interesting experience. What are the? Can you submit people? You can't submit people in there, but we were cheating when we were facing each other. But I mean, you can grab the the inseam of the uh, the pants, uh-huh. but you can grab inside the pants and grab the fabric because obviously it's yeah. hard to make grip. So yeah. we're reaching deep in there. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's the origins of the oil check. It dates back to ancient Turkey. <laughs> and what was the in in Bali? They're just doing jujitsu. Yeah, just a jiu-jitsu gym. He sort of uh, trains the local kids, and then he tries to re- he tries to help them. Like he, we'll be releasing this pretty soon, but he sort of helps the local community because Bali's full of Aussies going there to party and have fun. It's like our Mexico, mm-hmm. but uh, not many people see the sort of the poor the slum side. side. So yeah. like, he's one of the few Aussies that's doing good over there, not doing some damage. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, I was thinking about this this competition again, the CJI, and one one of the things I just was as we were talking, thinking about. I heard this story when they invented the atom bomb. That don't quote me on this, but it's like when you split that first hydrogen molecule, they there was a chance. Like some of the scientists thought, well, when we split that one and it releases this energy, that's going to hit other hydrogen. And those are going to split, and that's going to hit other ones, and it's basically going to destroy the Earth. Like, there's a certain part of this that was just unknown when they did it for the first time, that we might just literally blow up the entire Earth and kill everybody. And they had some whatever math figures that they were like, well, it probably won't happen. But when you take the best grapplers in the world, like you're doing, and then you put a million dollars into the mix, this could create total a a, a reaction that we haven't seen before because again you and i were talking about this at uh at the open mat like people will destroy get their mcl acl and pcl destroyed 
to win a nine dollar gold medal hilarious they'll do it you know they'll do that for uh well for for ten thousand dollars and people don't tap like i'm I, you know when people do in their first competition they'll be like you know what do you what do you you know got any advice i'm like yeah the guy's not gonna tap i tell people that all the time like oh you know you get to foot lock like people at a high level people aren't tap people they will tap but it's rare that someone just taps your straight ankle lock and you just break that thing I mean, Vinny Magalhaes, what kind of injuries has he had from just let that thing? What about the kid that, um, Mikey? Oh, yeah, that guy will never be the same, for sure. Dude, what? Wait, Mikey, Mikey who? He just kept he Mike, hooking Mikey Musamechi. Yeah. He was in Japan in the one championships, and he had this guy's leg. And he did every different variant of a heel hook and took it to the extreme and then switched it to the other side and took it to the extreme mm. and then took it to the other side and took it to the extreme and the dude did not tap. Mm-hmm. I mean, his his every ligament in his legs must be completely destroyed. That guy's like that robot thing now, hey? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the robot uh, jiu-jitsu <laughs> thing? Yeah, basically him. Yeah. Point, that guy's legs. So when you, I mean, a million dollars. Mi- yeah, 10,000. There's 000. no one that's tapping for a million dollars. Second place I don't is $10,001, so. you know, like... Yeah, I don't I don't see any of those guys tapping. Like this is the thing that you might have released. You might think you're going to get this cool tournament where there's like everyone's going for submission and then you find out no one's going to submit. Like the only move that you can get to someone is to put them to sleep. Yeah. Right? Cuz it would be entertaining for us. Yeah. What kind of waivers do they have to sign? Hopefully good ones. Yeah, you better get your lawyer freaking hot on that. Yeah. yeah. Quickly. I, th- I think it's hilarious because there's no second place, and that's what I've made a career of. There's no second place price, you know? <laughs> First or your last for this one. This is like a self-hatred thing that you're doing. Yeah, or $10,000. <laughs> Imagine losing $990,000 in the final. Yeah. A million dollars changes people's lives and possibly their children's lives like that's a ridiculous amount of money so i don't yeah i look at the the brackets of the people that that are going in this thing i mean nicky rod's not tapping to any no i don't think so would he tap to for his acl to be saved not for a million yeah he just had his first uh kid too so it's probably oh yeah there's zero percent chance he's not tapping uh joao rocha he's not tapping anything Victor Hugo? No. Go down the list of these guys. There's not there's not going to be tapping. Hopefully though. Otherwise it's a fucking long day that first day. <laughs> what what if I win but I can't walk? Do you have replacements? Do you have guys in the wings for replacements or do I get a bye? What if you win your match but then you're too injured? Yeah. I think you're out of there. But then who does the other person get to go again? I think we probably have to bring back the guy that you beat. I yeah, think, I yeah, think it's like essentially if, that's not really winning, right? Yeah, if you, if you have to go to hospital and the other guy didn't, he won. Like, <laughs> you know? See, so you, you need to make that part of the official rules for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? If yeah. you can't, because that'll, that'll actually encourage people to tap. Because if they're just going to just have their ACL destroyed or their shoulder destroyed and they know they can still go on and compete and possibly win. Yeah. There's going to be some injuries for sure. Yeah. Hopefully nothing too gruesome. Yeah. God. Right on. Gabby will get up for sure. <laughs> she ain't walking out of there, if you know what I mean. But. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> what's, your, uh, what's your long-term plan with this? I mean, we, we would love to be able to do it every year. We just wanted this first event to like just catapult the sport. Because mm-hmm. like another, another thing that I think they've put money in the wrong spot is uh, Mo mm-hmm. says he wants to go grappling. Obviously, it's, by a ticket sales metric, he's growing grappling, but then he's put it behind a paywall. We're putting ours free on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook. It'll be on Twitter or X. It'll be on everything free because we want to maximize the reach of the event mm-hmm. and have it free first to grow the sport and then obviously ultimately one day behind a paywall. But we also want to see all the metrics to see how many people actually tune in and watch because they keep all of that secret. Obviously, Flow Fight Pass doesn't oh, make okay. sense for them to tell the event how many viewers they get because then they'll leverage that in the negotiation process Mm -hmm. so we want it free so we see how many people really watch grappling so it's going to be on youtube streamed stream free yeah how many like camera angles are you gonna have you have a full production thing full production yeah did you hire somebody to do that some company coming in to do that my business partner took care of the uh logistics logistics things of that yeah we've got a really good crew on board for sure 
You have sponsors coming in. Sponsors coming in. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. We have Jocko Fuel's Jocko coming Fuel's in. Yeah, coming hell in. yeah, hell yeah. Who else is coming in? That's a that's a great question you that I should probably yet. know. Yeah, no, it's all good. <laughs> Give them all a shout out to everyone that's sponsoring. Yeah. You, we don't know the name of right now, except for Jocko Fuel. We know the name for that. That's even better. Yeah, <laughs> you're the only one. The only sponsor. <laughs> the only ones to step up. And and then so so your long term plan is hopefully you do this again next year. Yeah, hopefully again next year. I just really hope everything comes together. Obviously, I hope we get a sellout so we can donate as much money to charity as possible. I hope the athletes understand the significance of the event and fight to the death and make it exciting. You know what I mean? I hope all of those things come true because then we can keep having Mm -hmm. million dollar paydays. But like ultimately if someone goes out there and gets four boring decisions, you know, if they don't put it on the line when the audience is there to watch, it's going to be hard to justify doing this every year. So I really think it lies with each competitor. But my thesis is that if for a million they're going to go for it. Yeah. Um, what bigger incentive is there? The other guys in the other event that I haven't come across think it's easy to make a million dollars just if you win ADCC. Mm. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Meaning they think they can get sponsorships or sell videos or whatever? Yeah, they think like that they'll win ADCC. Oftentimes guys that win ADCC still, they're fin- they don't financially improve much yeah. at all. They're yeah. still struggling, but they sort of get sold a lie like you can have a moment at adcc that can make you famous because of the reach it has but it's hard to convert that into cash yeah unless really the fans take an interest in you and want to watch your instructionals but if you go out there and have four boring matches and win adcc you're not going to sell any instructionals like no one's going to buy the instructional being a boring cunt you know (laughs) (laughs) no you gotta go do something you know so yeah, well, if you're looking for people to try and kill each other and hurt each other and maim each other, I know you're not looking for that specifically, but that certainly makes for some excitement, mm. doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. And you know what? Obviously, I'm just kind of thinking whatever. But um, you know how they have like performance bonuses? Like I always thought, because every once in a while, I'll kind of think that, hey, if if the more is on the line, some people, there's two kind of kind of people. Some people, they want to freaking attack the what the prize is. The other kind of person will be like, well, I don't want to do anything dangerous because I don't want that million dollars to slip away, you know? So they they, they might play more reserved because they we don't do want to have lose. 50K performance bonus. Okay. Yeah, so I feel like, yeah, when you throw in a bunch of performance, you know, knock out of the uh, UFC style, right? Knock out of the night, fight of the night, all these blank XYZ of the night, then you might see a flurry of all this stuff and then everything put together will, might might incentivize collectively <sighs> so everybody what, so to, what to you, So that's a legitimate worry that... I'm fighting Craig Jones in the finals Mm -hmm. and I'm like, hopefully I can just win two, 10, eight, 10, nine rounds by, you know, getting a takedown and like holding you. Uh, That's a legitimate worry. Yeah. It's only five minutes, right? I can, I can eke it out to the next. And I'm not saying that everyone's going to do this. I'm saying there's two types of competitors in that way, you know, and it's so hard to predict human, what humans are going to do. And like what you were saying, Craig, about, the UFC fight pass thing where everyone's just asking questions to figure out how they can yeah. use the rules to their advantage. And that's why I think the judging is going to be really important. Mm. But I'll tell you, if someone gets like, uh, when I train with my consistent training partners, a lot of times we just have a rule. It's basically, it's almost like a pin rule. Like it, cause if, if I get a cross side on you or you get a cross side on me, like it's gonna be a lo- like I can hold you there for a long time. You can hold me there for a long time. It's like okay, what did we get out of that round? Mm-hmm. I held you across side for four minutes. You know mm-hmm. that's just not that beneficial. So if I'm in CJI and I get across side and I want to hold on to that million dollars and I know I kind of get this round. So yeah, gonna have to watch out for that. But that's why the judges are important. Mm-hmm. And I just think like guys on top shouldn't be so concerned with holding a pin They're like if you're on top of someone you should be positioning yourself in such a way that they keep burning energy mm-hmm. and sometimes if you get a guy two pinned in side control and the bottom guy just chills because yeah. he can't move he's not wasting energy and that's why i think sometimes taking the back is not always the best option because you throw in your two hooks the guy hand fights and he can rest mm-hmm. so it's like i think pa- continually passing or being close to a pass where the guy's defending, having to defend, you're forcing him to keep defending a pass Mm. and getting exhausted is the way to cook someone over those rounds. Mm. I'm going to go out on a limb 
because I'm trying to think of how to avoid, how would you avoid getting me past your guard and I hold you? I pass your guard in one minute and now I get a cross side and there's four minutes left and I'm just gonna win this this round 10-9 and that's good enough for me. Maybe like a pin could be a thing where if I hold you there for, what is it, judo 30 seconds or something like that? I don't know. Sorry, I'm going off in random directions. <laughs> yeah. That is a thing though. Is, is getting past the guard and holding someone is a thing. Yeah, I think, I mean, you should always be fighting for top position. I think mm-hmm. if the bottom guy is trying to get up or sweep, more things are going to go mm-hmm. down. There's going to be more scrambles, more submission attempts. Mm-hmm. Everything gets better when there's an incentive to be on top. Mm-hmm. But I think it's sort of like an just the ability to fatigue your opponent is the gift you get from being on top. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's going to be wild, man. Frick, yeah. <laughs> right. It will be fighting to the death. But, I mean, I, I could see that sorting itself out to be that way for sure what are the dates of the competition it's august 17th so, yes yeah, august 16th 17th so you still i mean adcc 17 18 mm-hmm. we start late on saturday and we'll be there on friday so you could buy tickets to both events theoretically watch largely most of each of the events you Sweet. could easily watch the finals of us and the finals of adcc nice so we haven't completely Killed. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's event. nice because people can go one weekend to Vegas and see all the best grapplers in the world. I just hope um, I know we will do pass outs if you come to us and you want to go to you want to go back and forth throughout the day. I just hope ADCC you do that too, yeah. so that if you've bought tickets to both, mm-hmm. say you want to watch this bracket and this match, you can because the arenas will be pretty close to each other. <laughs> yeah, what are they like a five minute walk, ten minute walk? I think probably ten minute drive. Oh, ten minute drive. That's a little further than I thought. Okay, cool. Um, I looked for your your uh, Craig Jones Invitational website, and I didn't find it. I was going to actually text Echo in the middle of the night oh, last night and say, like, dude, I Googled it. What is it? So, fuck, what is it? Fight Foundation? Something like the that? Fight Foundation dot the, com or org. I should know I'm pretty sure. It's, but is that where you go for CJI? Fightfoundation.com. Yeah, that's where... All the information is obviously me flexing on okay. here. Yeah. Fightfoundation.com. That's where you can find information for this. Fightfoundation.com, yeah. Or oh, Instagram. This has been largely a Instagram marketing campaign of yeah. harassment against other people, really. Yeah. You you do the, um, you could go teach a class at Harvard when you're done with this about viral, no, what do they call it? Guerrilla marketing. marketing. That's one of Echo Charles is kind of guerrilla marketing. I understand. There. That's what you're doing. You're doing literal, there, you could go teach a class at Harvard. I mean, if this thing goes well. If it doesn't go well, you can also <laughs> teach a class on what not yeah. to do. <laughs> but that guerrilla marketing thing is a real thing, you know? Because you pulled over, just again, for people that don't know, this guerrilla marketing thing, you pulled over some of the champions and some of the best people from the other competition over to your competition. The Rutolo brothers are coming over. Um, you got just a bunch, of, a bunch of studs. The Tackett brothers are going over. Who else is on here? We man? got everyone but New Wave, basically. New Wave decided to have their own tournament, mm-hmm. so unfortunately, that'll be a New Wave open mat ADCC. Jason Nolf. How'd you, get, how'd you end up with Jason Nolf? No, we, obviously, we want to lure in the wrestling crowd yeah. as well. But Nolf, he's been training jiu for a long time. No, so he's, he's a freaking actually, savage. He's tough. He's tough. So three, five-minute rounds against a wrestler. And we spoke to Bo Nickel. Bo Nickel was talking about it. He wanted to do the under 80, but ultimately... Mm. Hold, but like they could win oh yeah I mean? they could like yeah if you have jason nolf take you down and pass your guard like that's you're not getting up this dude has been holding people down since he was four years old <laughs> yeah yeah and i've trained with him i know how good he is so it's like people are gonna get a surprise like if you're a jiu-jitsu guy that's heavily focused on wrestling and you draw jason nolf good yeah, luck yeah, yeah good luck you, you know? can take your little whatever how many years I've been, tra- I've been really concentrating on wrestling for the last five years. <laughs> the dude's like, I've, I'm four years old and I was doing double legs yeah, in the just backyard. Beat, just beat Burroughs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a bunch of studs. Uh, what else, man? Does that get us up to speed? Pretty much on the tournament, yeah. What about life? You good? Pretty good, yeah. Hey, well, I guess you, you've been kind of mentioning a couple times you're going to go against, against Gabby Reese. Garcia. Or, Garcia, sorry, Gar- Garcia Gabby yeah. Garcia, who's 10-time world champion, female. She's 240 pounds or something like that. That's a big woman, yeah. And you guys are going to do what? Same roles? 
Sam Rose, I think we're doing five by five, three by five. I don't know. I don't know. But we'll finish her as quick as the scheduling requires. You know what I mean? If we're running over, we'll uh, take her out quick, no foreplay. <laughs> how did that come up? Like, how when did you decide to do that? With the origins of that, she competed at Flow Grappling and gave some impassioned speech about how anyone that calls her out, she'll take on. And I said, that <laughs> sounds like something I'd do. Craig Jones. <laughs> Craig I'll Jones. Thinking guy. outside the box of here. Like, yeah. All right. And that was it? You're like, okay. I'm going to do that basically yeah have a few beers on the day get sure to get the job done sure <laughs> see all the sponsorship I'll go a long way for that one <laughs> and then when you um announced it or approached her with it what was she like are you serious or was she like hell yeah or what what was her response it's it's swayed back and forth i would say over the years you mm-hmm. know what i mean but ultimately we got pen to paper she took a stand against a adc well against the organizers less than the event and decided to jump on board for this one. Oh yeah but yeah she's on board fully That's legit. and what are you guys gonna go when are you gonna do your match with her like that'll before be, the finals yeah that'll be before the final probably i think it'll be fion mckenzie then me and gabby and then the finals mm. so it'll be excited it'll be exciting it's gonna be a good day, dude. It's a good couple of days. I've done no great. training for it. <laughs> <laughs> Already making your excuses, getting them logged in. Oh, well, I yeah. mean, that's a good one to have a rematch for, you know. <laughs> oh, that's right. Setting up the whole the whole freaking storyline right now. Yeah, yeah. Check. Anything else, man? Echo, you any more questions? Yeah, let's go back to the TRT oh, okay. steroids oh, okay. kind of scenario. Yeah, well, I don't know. You kind of mentioned kind of your stack loosely. You know, um, is that pretty typical for you know? Compa- I know, like, Ooh. there's a group of competitors that are like, "Hell yeah, we're going all out!" And yeah, I mean, most of the guys will take anything. I mean, they're taking everything and anything to win the ten thousand dollars in the ADCC medal. So, like, who knows what they're taking for the million? <laughs> yeah, you know? it's crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wanted to test them, not to block them or anything, but just to see, <laughs> just what, see just like bragging rights. <laughs> yeah, just to see, <laughs> see what up, man. See, see what their levels are at, you know. Yeah, but um, <laughs> for me, I keep it pretty low, pretty stable these days. I don't go too crazy. Mm-hmm. People have tried. I mean, even your training partners won't really tell you what they're taking, so it's kind of yeah. like a mystery. But no one wants to admit to any part of it. But I at yeah. least wanted to admit to what I'm taking, so like, if any of the youth see it, they at least know that you can accomplish things on a not a crazy, dangerous stack. You know, yeah. they don't start at the up here. Is that why you take it mainly for like? your competitive reasons or like you know f- to, for competition and stuff or is it just sort of like generally speaking you know i, just I want, mean these you know, days gen- general health you yeah. know like uh when i first did a cycle it helped me gain weight because i had qualified for adcc in the weight division above me mm. because my coach at the time did the one below so i was like oh fuck we'll get we'll put on some muscle be in the right division because yeah. when i faced homolo in 2015 i was only 80 kilos he was 88 mm. and then when i qualified again for 80 i was like fuck i better at least be in the right div- division so instead of like taking my diet and recovery and lifting seriously i thought i'd just do a crazy <laughs> stack <laughs> gain some weight that way and you said that you do feel it like the difference like i, I mean, mean obviously you're gonna yeah. feel the difference obviously but yeah. like is it that big a deal like you did gain weight obviously that first cycle you definitely feel yeah you hit it out the gates harder you feel it yeah after then not so much Pink just people. i just know i'd feel worse without it you know do you feel because everybody says once you go on it and then you come off it, you go worse, right? Because now your body stops making testosterone. Did you feel all that kind of effect? Yeah, the first cycle I did, I did a, I did some bodybuilding cycle. Because again, you don't know what people are taking. You're just asking your buddies. You know, at the time you're like, what the fuck? I mean, I used to get into Tijuana, hit a pharmacy, and jab it in the quad in the bathroom. But um, things have come a long way since then. <laughs> but when I first came, because the old school logic was cycle on and come off. But mm. I think. It's not really that healthy for your body to be doing this. I think it'd be better to be stable. So I think personally healthier mm. to not go on and off, on and off. Maybe up it a little bit if you have an important tournament. Mm. Yeah, maybe get somebody who's like a real professional about your whole situation mm. as yeah. well rather than the experimental scenario. What about uh, mentally? Like, I don't know, emotionally, what you know, your day to day. Oh, like I mean, going yeah, on f- and off and all that. Like the first time I came off, you definitely feel the those estrogen effects. You know, you feel a bit emotional. Like what? A lot of crying. You know. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, <laughs> now you feel a bit down. Obviously, you feel down when you come off. I think that's why people used to take the PCT, post cycle therapy, because like um, your test crashes, but your estrogen takes a bit of time to mm. follow it up. Mm. But I mean, it's still, it's different for everyone. Yeah. You know. Again, I know people that 
take their first injection think they feel it you're like some of that's got to be placebo too mm. but for me mine's been stable dosage for years now so it's like it is just the baseline for yeah, me yeah. the only side effect would be probably shooting blanks but that could be good too you know yeah. <laughs> that is male birth control sure, sure. Or at least that's what i tell them yeah and, and did you lift it all when you were trying to get bigger or did i you lifted just yeah do juice? <laughs> <laughs> i lift but it's just uh i did lift when i had a more stable lifestyle now i barely even have a house i just travel full time yeah. that makes it hard you know goes a long way if there's a squat rack in a hotel but there rarely is yeah and if that is out of the hotel, that's too big an obstacle for me to go find. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll just do whatever's in the hotel. So you're not really uh, lifting very much? No. If I have the energy, I'll do it, though. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to feel motivated. <laughs> it's hard to get the motivation up. Plus, I want Gabby to look a lot bigger than me. Oh, yeah. That'll be good. Yeah, I don't want to come sure. in looking more stacked than her. That kind of kills the appeal of the match. I've been calling her up and like, take more Anavar. Fucking yeah. take more steroids, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's a good point. Right on. Wait, good. Echo, you good? Oh, well, you know, in the spirit of not wasting too much of Craig Jones' time. Yeah. It well, is great to uh, to see you again. I remember I saw you briefly back in back in the day. Oh, back yeah, in the day. Yeah, it was weird. I, I heard that you trained at Victory back in the day. But I didn't know if you were there for like six months or like six hours. Yeah, I think I just, just a week. Know. A yeah. week, maybe. So then today when you told me you were there for a week, I was like, cool. Because I kind of felt bad. Like, I didn't really remember you being there, probably because I was out of town or something. So. That was before the cycle. So you probably didn't see <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah, you look different. <laughs> yep. Yep. So okay. uh, does that get us up to speed? We good? I reckon, yeah. Right on. Um, people can find you. You got B Team Jiu Jitsu, B Team JJ, B Team JJ. Dot com. Dot com. Fightfoundation.com, Fight Foundation. which is where all the information about this massive, life-changing, game-changing event's going to be. You're on Instagram, Craig Jones BJJ. You also have at CJI official. This is where, and your um, your Instagram is quite entertaining. It's that's the goal. Yeah, that's yeah. the money maker. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so get in there to that. You also have a YouTube channel, B Team Jiu Jitsu. B Team Jiu Jitsu, yeah. And you it. post a bunch of wild stuff in there. I just watched the thing about the Rutolo brothers, and that was awesome to watch. Those guys are, I've known those guys since they were little kids, and it's so cool to see them growing up and getting after and doing what they're doing. And that's some places where you can find it. Where, is it going to be YouTube streamed on that channel, you think? Yeah, yeah, just because it's easier because yeah, it's already there. Established audience. And you're there, you're in there. And we still are the subscribers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can double double dip on those guys. Um, awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you swinging by. Thank thanks for coming guys. by to train this morning. And uh, thanks for taking care of the jiu-jitsu competitors and getting more jiu-jitsu out to the world, man. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, guys. Right on, brother. And with that, Craig Jones has left the building. Training. Training. Did you roll with Craig Jones today? I did not roll with Craig Jones today. Some good rolls this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Some good open mat activities. I feel like this, and wait, maybe you mentioned it. Who mentioned it? You, maybe mentioned Carrie. What? I forget that Craig Jones, he rolled up and, you know, okay, so there's different vibes. There's mm -hmm. different goals. There's different, there's different approaches you can take for any, any given day of training. Okay. And today was the day that Craig Jones and a couple other people were like, hey, look, this is not a crazy training day. I know oh. it's Sunday open <laughs> mat, but bro, I'm going to get around. I get two rounds, maybe three. Yeah. And then we're going to go ahead and keep it pushing. Some people were like that. Yeah. That's me sometimes. You know, we were driving home, myself and my daughters, and Rana. Today? Said to my, yeah, mm. today, after we all got done training. Oh, yeah. And, you know, because it – Common common issue, right? Before training, do you always feel like going to train? No. You don't always feel like going to train. So one of my daughters did not feel like going to train this morning. Mm -hmm. But, you know, hey, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Fam jitsu. Fam jitsu all day. Hell yeah. And so as we're driving home, my one daughter said to my other daughter, don't you feel good now that you trained? Yeah. And you know what my other daughter said? Yeah. yeah. 100%. Oh, yeah. It's always going to feel better when you train. I had that exact same, or not that exact same, but very similar conversation with Wes, our guy Wes, mm -hmm. 
where, you know, he's talking about, you know, like, you know, the different levels, like some people, they want to be the competitor. Sometimes you want to just be a hobbyist. Sometimes you just want jujitsu to be a general, just part of your life. You're not in there trying to compete with every single person, every single minute of every single round. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it changes. Sometimes you want to be a competitor. And then after a while, you're like, wait a second, maybe I have a family now, whatever. And then now you're a hobbyist, you know, kind of thing. There's a dynamic to Mm -hmm. people's jujitsu pursuits. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and I, that's what we talked about, right? Mm-hmm. During that time where it's like, hey, sometimes, bro, you're not always fired up to just go train jujitsu. Sometimes you're like, you know what? I've, I should go mm-hmm. because when I'm done, I'll be very happy that I went. Yeah. And that's literally the case every single time, 100% of the time. Even the days that I got injured, I'm happy I went. What about with the variations between different people? Yeah. Because the reason I bring this up is uh, Carrie was filming today. Sure, He's filming, yeah. yeah. And you know he's like I he's like oh I got some footage and I was like oh cool he goes dude whenever you like as soon as you shake hands with Sloan like I just hit record because yeah, yeah. it's on yeah it's on not that I'm you know the level of Sloan but like we just kind of yeah. go hard <laughs> oh yeah fully and then yeah and then some people some days they're like all you know like hard training mm-hmm. and then sometimes hey it's more of like a mellow training even mm-hmm. though it's unstated you don't say you're not mm-hmm. saying hey i'm training mellow today no you just train mellow mm-hmm. and then you're one of those guys who's real good at matching the other guy's energy mm-hmm. you know and yeah that's a oh, fully that's a real thing and you can go like today was one guy you're rolling with is just a cruise roll yeah. on purpose and then the next roll is freaking <laughs> is, is all out death match so yeah that's real too that's part of the gig do this this cji is going to be very it is literally uh an unknown we're yeah. going into the world of the unknown because yeah. when you put a million dollars on on the line yeah a million dollars yeah. on the line yeah these guys are going to go and there's the competition sick dude they're yeah. freaking sick so, so there the there's another element to it which is cool given craig jones's um one of his goals is to get more eyeballs on jujitsu mm-hmm. because it's when you think about it, it's interesting what people will watch if there's a million dollars on the line. Yeah. They don't even have to oh, be into it. Oh, that's a good it. point. Because Mr. Beast, you know the uh, YouTube guy? Yeah, yeah. Dude, he people will watch because there's a million dollars on the line. Yeah. How long can you stay on this circle or yeah. put your finger on this telephone pole or whatever he's yeah. doing? Oh, yeah. A million people will watch that. Oh, yeah. Maybe even more than one million people will watch oh, it. Oh, yeah, more than that. Yeah. And, and yeah, so why is it? Because they like to see how long someone can stand in a circle? No. Yeah, yeah. Like, no one cares about how long a random person can stand in a circle. How long can you? Like, no one cares. Put a million dollars on there. Now we all of a sudden care. Yeah. And we actually kind of care a lot. Yeah. I'll watch it. Yeah. And now you take that and you say, hey, we're going to give one million dollars to the person here that can survive an onslaught of other people trying to break their limbs yeah. or choke them unconscious. Yeah. I think I think chokes are going to have to be a thing because I don't think people are tapping, dude. I really don't think people are tapping. Yeah. Because, huh? cause, dude, like I said, people don't tap in the training room. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not saying everybody, but there's times where people get hurt in the training room because they did not tap. Yep. Yeah. Fully. That that happens all the time. Yeah. So now you put them in competition. Mm. Now they're definitely not tapping. Right, but now you put a million dollars on the line. Maybe I'm just a little bit obsessed with that idea right now. But yeah. I think it's going to change some. I think it's going to change. I think there's some some unknown. It's an unknown element that we're yeah. getting into. Yeah. You can kind of imagine a lot of stuff, actually, when you really think about it. Where I mean, you know how you guys were met, you mentioned, um, like, what if you can't continue or whatever? I think where it stands the reason that if I like pop my elbow because I didn't tap to an arm bar or whatever, Mm -hmm. but I won the match. Mm -hmm. Bro, I'm showing up for that next match, 100%. Bro, I'll try not to use this arm. And bro, if I lose, I lose better than not. Bro, the million dollars still there. I think everyone's showing up. Oh, yeah. No one going to the hospital. Bro, that guy's limping out on the mat. Yeah, yeah. Guys will be limping out on the mat. (laughs) Guys are going to be crawling. There might, there might, I I predict there's a decent chance that someone is on their, you know, on their haunches dragging themselves onto the mat. Yeah. Trying to get it. I predict that yeah. because there's a million dollars and you know what you can train with an injury and still get a sub yeah. you know what I mean you can yeah. happen oh, yeah. and why would you not take that chance yeah fully so this is the element of the there isn't a huge element of the unknown here of what's going to go down yeah, I think chokes are going to be popular yeah chokes are going to be very popular 
Yeah, especially that the first one. Yeah. Like no yeah. one knows the gaming. You know, like bro, they're just going out. Like bro, remember Metamorris? The yeah. first Metamorris had a lot had a lot of submissions because no one was like they didn't know. They're just like frick. We just better go out there. And, you know, they didn't know. Yeah, yeah, they didn't have any kind of game plan. Yeah, as much. You know, when you think thirty, because weren't those rounds thirty minutes, twenty minutes, twenty, yeah, twenty minutes seems like a long time. Yeah, no points. Yeah, so until you like, go. Oh, you know what? If I just can make it through twenty minutes, and dude, that. Even though that can be a long time, it can also not be that long of a time. Yeah, fully. And if you're surviving, especially if you're like the massive underdog, you just survive. You're like, draw, you know, mm-hmm. like, but no one figured that out until mm-hmm. like later because it's, the, you know, the first one, you know. So, yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. Very interesting. Jason Nolf will be interesting to watch. Mm. Three, three time NCAA champ because he's and he trains jujitsu too. But yeah, that's going to be an interesting one. There's so many good guys in there. So many good guys in there. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm looking forward to it. We train in. We are training. I'm gonna need some fuel. Yes. Craig Jones is on a different kind of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> it's been interesting. You know, he's been open about his his steroid use. Yeah. And he was talking about it today. Mm-hmm. But I don't recommend that kind of stuff. I know that there's some level of it that people can do, mm. but I don't recommend it. Hey, I guess if you're going to a doctor and you have some issues, you need to get through those. But there is some other kind of fuel you can use. Yeah, let's I just, recommend you at least start with the other kind of fuel. Yeah, let's let's just say you and I look. I'll put myself in the same boat. We are not in any position to make those types of recommendations mm-hmm. at this point. Mm-hmm. But we can recommend Jocko fuel. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah, by experience, by knowledge, the whole thing, performance, the whole deal. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Jocko fuel is official sponsor of the Craig Jones Invitational. So you know, we'll be up there. We'll be getting after it. Uh-huh. Be hanging out. And watching some, f- eesh. I think we're gonna watch people get choked yeah. to sleep because mm. you're no way you're tapping to a choke. That's a zero percent chance. There's mm. not another prediction. No one's tapping to a choke. Mm. You can put me to sleep and I'll fight it until I'm unconscious. Yeah. Period. I, end of story. Yeah, I feel like that. I You've mean, been choked out before, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 You times. don't. You don't. Like at a certain point. It's just happening. Yeah. And you're, well, it's like, too late. Then again, I, I, of course, everyone's different, but I'm trying to think, okay, and consider this for yourself as well. Mm-hmm. When have you been choked out unconscious? Under what circumstance? Because there, I can't, I don't think, and I don't think I would even do this where I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of a tap and then mm-hmm. let myself go out. And I've never mm-hmm. done that. Mm-hmm. But I have been trying to get out of a choke, mm-hmm. like a freaking uh, a Darce choke, like literally up. trying to get out of there. And then, yeah, just waking up all yeah. of a sudden. Or um, like a triangle or something. I remember I was in a triangle mm-hmm. and it was like, it, I feel it, but it doesn't feel super tight. Mm-hmm. And then I just woke up, you know, mm-hmm. it's like that. It's like I didn't know better, yeah. you know, or if uh, another one where the round was about to end yeah. and then I was like, oh, I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. I'm going to beat the bell yeah. or whatever. And then, yeah, I got choked Dude, up. Sloan had me in a choke today and I looked at the clock seven seconds left and I was like, oh, there's, Four. I can hold my breath for seven seconds, which yeah. I'm about to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I held my breath for seven seconds, and then, do you know how the 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 clock was my phone today? Yeah, and it was like, ping. Yeah, it's all quiet. <laughs> the yeah. round ended, yeah. and I didn't know how much you know. Yeah. And so he got me, and I looked at the clock. It was like already into the red. Oh of like yeah, it was time yeah. so over. You guys just didn't stop. Yeah. Essentially. Well, yeah. yeah, we didn't stop yeah. until I tapped. Yeah. And then I was. I looked at the clock. I go, bro, you're out of time. You know. Yeah. Didn't count. Doesn't count. Yep. Just yeah. It counted it's though. Part of the gig. Bro. So, uh, Jocko Fuel. <laughs> back to the subject at hand. Um, if you need something, if you need protein, what you do? If you need greens, what you do? If you need hydration, what you do? If you need joint protocol. You need something for your joints, which you do. Check out jockofuel.com. Get some milk protein. Get some joint warfare. Get some super curl. Get it. Get it. Go to jockofuel.com. Also, we have like a text thing, SMS thing. If you text jockofuel to the number 24672, I'll send you a voicemail occasionally. Say what up. Yeah, yeah. To get after it. Uh, check out jockofuel.com. Also, Wawa, Vitamin Shop, GNC, Military Commissaries, Hafees, Hannaford, or Hafees, Hannaford, Dash Stores in Maryland, Wakefern, ShopRite, HEB, Meyer, Wegmans, Harris Teeter, Lifetime Fitness, Shields, and a bunch of small gyms. We got Jackson and Jared out there on the road. They're getting after it. 
They're like showing up. To talk about a rogue jujitsu scenario. Mm. Just showing up in schools. Hey, do you guys want to sell Jocko Fuel? Cool. Can I train? And that's what those guys are doing. Oh, uh, yeah, like jujitsu schools. Yeah, yeah, jujitsu yeah. schools. Yeah. <laughs> so if those guys show up at your school, get yourself some, some Jocko Fuel in your academy, in your CrossFit gym, in your gym, in your powerlifting gym. If you want that, email jfsales at jocko.com. Jockofuel.com. JFSales at jockofuel.com. And we'll see you at the CJI Invitational. You coming? Yes, sir. 100%? 100%. Surgeries are going to happen. <laughs> Check. We'll see about that. Also, speaking of jujitsu, probably going to need that jujitsu gi or the jujitsu rash guard or the jujitsu shorts. Go to originusa.com and get stuff that's made in America. Get stuff that doesn't support communism, doesn't support slave labor, doesn't support destruction of the environment. Does this sound like I'm talking about some crazy foreign uh, situation to you? No, I'm talking about actually what happens. Slave labor makes your clothes in China. That's what happens. Then they take all the exhausted fumes and waste and they throw it into the river. It's terrible. We don't support that. We support freedom. We support America. We support originusa.com. I just ordered, we have these new shirts. Yeah. Okay, so the RTX training shirts, yeah. we have an upgraded version of that. Mm -hmm. They're so good. They're perfect. It's made with this material called Burr, B-R-R-R-R. -R 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 -R. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. Except for my wife. Mm. You know, sometimes she has t trouble pronouncing things. Sure. She calls it bruh. <laughs> <laughs> so the bruh. The bruh. Yeah, because, you know, in Britain, Australia, mm. Boston, Hawaii, mm -hmm. they don't they don't pronounce the R at the end of a word. Yeah, yeah, because my wife says, bah. Yeah. Bah. <laughs> bruh. Yeah. Bruh. Hey, hey, that's how Hawaii is, too. You talk pigeon, that's how. Well, it's it, the thing is, the stuff is that super light, like silky weight mm. base layer Yeah, that you just, it's perfect for everything. Yeah. So... I just ordered a. I just ordered four, black four. There's a color called ice, which is like a light color. So when yeah. it's hot out, it's like I, blue, but it's white. Yeah, it's like, like but blue. it's got a blue tint yeah, to it. Yeah, exactly. So I got four of those, and I got four green. Oh yeah, called rifle green. Yeah, I don't know who came up with the name rifle green, but it's called rifle green as opposed to pine green. But it's like a. It's not quite an olive drab, but it's it's like olive drab adjacent. Yeah, yeah, it's like a what do they call it? Military green. Yeah, it's like a military-ish greenish yeah. color. Yeah, it's cool. So I just ordered for myself f those four colors. So, anyways, check those out. They're awesome. They're they're just the perfect. They're perfect for working out. They're perfect for you got to wear like some kind of a piece of clothing to look nice or whatever. Yeah. We can wear these things underneath and feel comfortable, feel cool. Yeah. It's got minerals in it or something that makes it feel cool. Like when you put it on, it feels cool. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's some tech. So originusa.com, get yourself some American-made awesomeness. Mm -hmm. Also, we have a, a jiu-jitsu camp. The jiu-jitsu camp is sold out, but we still have room on our law enforcement, military, first responders, jiu-jitsu training, August 27th to August 31st in Maine. So come and check that out after you get done watching the CJI. Yep. And you know what else? Yep, I do know what else. Jocko has a store. Yeah. It's called Jocko Store. Go to jockostore.com. This is where you can get your Discipline Equals Freedom shirts. Uh, there's hats on there. There's hoodies on there. There's shorts on there as well. Also represent the idea of good. A few versions of that. You know, mm -hmm. various uh, apparel items on that one. Um, anyway, a lot of other stuff on there. Not just those two things. So, yeah, check it out. Um, there are also, among those things, is a thing called the Shirt Locker. Membership scenario. Mm -hmm. Cool t-shirts for you to wear. Yep, it's true. Different design every month. A little bit outside of the box. In a good way, not in a bad way. Okay. It's true. Yeah, no, I believe you. Good feedback on that one. You yeah, know, yeah, Let's face it. In hey, fact, you know what? You know what tells me it's good? Because people request the old shirts because mm -hmm. they're that dope. Oh, yeah. And yeah, in certain, at certain times, I'll wear certain ones and then... People will call me and text me and be like, hey, where do I get that shirt? Because mm -hmm. they like it. Anyway, it's called The Shirt Locker. New design every month. It's on jockostore.com. There you go. Also, check out coloradocraftbeef.com or primalbeef.com to get yourself some steak or some ground beef. 
Yep. Or even some hot dogs. Mm -hmm. Some beef hot dogs, <coughs> which are hella good, by the way. Yes. So check those out. You need steak in your life. Make you stronger. Make you better. Make you faster. Make you smarter. Primalbeef.com. ColoradoCraftBeef.com. The best beef from awesome people. Awesome companies. Subscribe to the podcast. Also check out Jocko Underground. Also check out our YouTube. Also check out Psychological Warfare. Also check out Flipside Canvas. Dakota Meyer making cool stuff to hang on your wall. I've written a bunch of books. So you can check those out as well. You can get them wherever you get books. Check out the Warrior Kid books. The Way of the Warrior Kid series. So you can help your kids or your neighbors or your nephew or your, your sister's neighbor's kids. Get these books for those kids. It's like $12, you know what I mean? And you change the trajectory of their lives. So check those out. Also, Mikey and the Dragons, also about face by Hackworth, extreme ownership, dichotomy of leadership, you guys know the gig. Speaking of which, speaking of leadership, we have a leadership consultancy, it's called Echelon Front. We solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com if you have problems inside your organization and you need help with those problems, those problems are leadership problems and we will help you solve those problems through leadership. Also, we have online training. Talked about that today, we talked about some of the online training, whether it's bjjfanatics.com, it's, it's an online training platform for jujitsu and guys have gotten excessively good, extraordinarily good from online training. There's a bunch of other things like that for jujitsu. It's kind of interesting, right? If you think you can learn jujitsu from watching videos and you can get exceptional from watching videos, jujitsu is a physical skill. Well, we have a mental skill of leadership. And just like you train jujitsu for moves, you need to train leadership to learn the techniques, learn the strategies, learn the moves of leadership. And if you want that online training, go to extremeownership.com and check out some of those courses. Also, if you wanna help service members active and retired, you wanna help their families, you wanna help Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got an amazing charity organization that helps our veterans heal. If you wanna donate, or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. Also check out heroesandhorses.org. Micah Fink got people up in the damn forest, mountains, hunting animals with a whittled down piece of stick, killing bears, mm -hmm. getting after it, and killing their demons as well. And that's what it's all about. Also, Jimmy May's organization, beyondthebrotherhood.org. So that's what we're doing. If you want to connect with us, once again, on the interwebs, bteamjj.com. Check out fightfoundation.com if you are interested in that CJI activity. On Instagram, if you want to talk to or interact with Craig Jones, he's got a lot of funny stuff on there. Craig Jones, BJJ on Instagram. CJI official on Instagram. YouTube, B-Team Jiu Jitsu. As for us, I'm at jocko.com. I'm also on social media. I'm at Jocko Willink. Echoes at Echo Charles. Just be careful because you should be training or lifting or writing or reading instead of scrolling. But if you need to check in on us, that's where we're at. Also, once again, thanks to Craig Jones for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming by for the rolls this morning. Good times. And thanks for spreading the word of jujitsu. And we get to train jiu-jitsu and we get to go to competitions and we get to enjoy the sport and we get to enjoy life and freedom because of the folks out there in uniform around the world who protect our way of life. So thanks to all of you. Also, thanks to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, as well as all other first responders. I hope you all are training jiu-jitsu as well because it will help you protect yourselves and help you protect us. So thank you for what you do, and go train jiu-jitsu. And everyone else out there, same thing. If you're not training jiu-jitsu, give it a shot. Go down to a local jiu-jitsu academy. Walk on in there. Tell them you'd like to train. Your life will get better. And if you do train, then you know what to do. Keep getting after it. And that's all we've got for tonight. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko.